fucking zero hours contracts and yeah. sports direct <laughs> public beheadings. Ah, yeah. never mind that. It's fucking miles that? away. Hello and welcome back to the What The Fork Sunderland preview podcast in association with Viper Goalkeeping. It feels like an absolute eternity since Sunderland last played a game, although I don't think it was that long ago. But thankfully, the lads returned this Saturday with a long old trip to Gillingham. As always, we've got an opposition fan on with us today to discuss the goings on at Gillingham. And for regular listeners of the podcast, I don't really think I need to do that much of an introduction. Um, welcome back to the show for about the 40th or 50th time. Matt from Jill's in the Blood, how are you, mate? You okay? I'm very well, thank you. Aside from my football team at the moment, I was just thinking, could we maybe start up the uh, the England pod again? Because it was quite nice to spend the summer talking about a team that was winning on a regular basis. And unfortunately, Jules are doing anything but at the moment. But apart from that, I'm all good. I was just saying that, like last time we actually spoke on a podcast, officially on this one anyway, because obviously we're speaking on like a weekly basis, I think. But um, England had just lost on penalties in the, the Euro 2020 final. And I'm not really sure I've recorded a, a podcast in a more sombre mood and you're probably the same. Are you feeling any better yet? Uh, I think Jules have helped me forget about that because they've been even more shit than England were from the spot back in July. Um, but <laughs> whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I'm not sure. But it's um, it's been a struggle so far this season and I'm sure we'll get into that. But um, yeah, I think I'm over England in the sense that just because time's a healer. Um, but I miss that whole carnival atmosphere that we had in the summer and, and doing regular podcasts and talking about a team that was playing really well and the weather was decent it was hot it was sunny it was long nights and now it's it's October it's dark at half six Jules can't score a goal let alone buy a fucking win so but what can you do eh? you still keep getting up and you still keep going went all the way to Wickham on Saturday to watch us go 2-0 down inside 420 seconds so and I'd probably do it again yeah, well, that's, what, that's what we do, isn't it? What we, we we all have clubs with souls. Not that I was insinuating anything there, of course. Um, we'll dig straight into it. I suppose you've mentioned it there, the the Gillingham game. But your most recent result, obviously, you played at the weekend. Two 0 defeat were against Wickham Wanderers away. Statistically, it looked like it was a relatively even game. Same shots on target and stuff like that. But when you concede goals in the second and the seventh minute, it means you've lost it before it even begins. Um, how did you assess the game on Saturday? Obviously, you were there. Um, I like a stat. <laughs> I do use them. I'm not into XG and all that type of thing, but I don't mind a, a shot on target or a chance created or a, a dribble completed, the factual stuff. But um, yeah, if you'd looked at the stats on any app or any Sky Sports website, BBC or anything like that, like you said, you'd have thought it was a quite even game. It was anything but. We were absolutely horrendous from start to finish, aside from about 15 minutes, 20 minutes at the end of the first half where... We missed a penalty and, and that pretty much summed up the day, unfortunately. The highlight of the day, and uh, there's a little story, and you've probably seen it on one of the uh, sports websites, was the announcement that came out over the tannoy that was either just before or during half time that said, can the owner of a white Mercedes registration plate, blah, 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 um, please go back to the field that you've parked on because it's quite a steep hill and you've left your handbrake off. So, and I've seen pictures on the websites um, over the last couple of days, yeah, and apparently it got wedged with two traffic cones to stop it rolling any further. I'd imagine it was probably a Jules fans because that sums up our day again. So I'd imagine it wasn't a Wickham fan. Um, yeah, but yeah, that, that made us laugh. Um, apart from that, there wasn't anything to smile about in terms of the Jules performance or the result. And of course, one of them lovely things that comes around where an ex-striker who leaves and gets berated by the away support at kickoff, of course, scores one of the goals. Yeah, I feel like Sunderland's championship season for some reason was like that. I remember Ledbetter and Daryl Murphy scoring in the 85th minute on a Tuesday night. Yeah, it wasn't. Yeah, yeah, I know that feeling's not great. Sorry to bring in the sorry Sunderland fans to bring in depressive memories. We've been all right this season. Um, back to Gillingham, the results left you with I think it's one win in nine league games, and that means you've lost. I think you lost three games, including the uh, Pizza Trophy two 0 mm-hmm. I think I've, you've maybe answered this, but I'll ask it anyway. Are things as bad as the sound? The Saturday was, yeah. I, I can't dress that up. I'm 
if anyone who listens to my channel watches my channel, I try to say it as I see it. I don't try and dress it up to be anything other than what it is, and it was crap at best. Um, we made a change at the break. I said it was a like-for-like like change, and it literally was a like-for-like like change because the person that went off, the game had passed him by for 45 minutes, and we bought Stuart O'Keefe on, and the game passed him by for 45 minutes. We then had to bring on a substitute defender because our left-back went down injured, so that adds to it as well. So he's going to be out for a period of time. Um, and I couldn't fathom for the life of me. With one change left, we had two strikers on the bench. Both young, I get that, but... They warm up for the entirety of the second period and not one of them gets on. 2-0 down. Why not chuck one on and have a go? At least I'd have rather lost 3-0 having a go, but it just looked like we went, it's 2-0. Fuck it, we'll take it and that, that'll do. And, and that pissed me off a lot. And I don't, Steve Evans doesn't piss me off a lot. I think, you know, he's, he's, he's done a brilliant job at Gillingham. Um, you know, there's an order in terms of everything in football, especially in this division at this season. And I'm not going to sit and talk about budgets and all that type of thing, because I'm sure if, any Sunderland or Jules fan listens to any press conference in the next few days, they'll hear all about it from our gaffer. But there is a natural order. But it was just like we rolled over on Saturday and went, oh, we'll take 2 0 because we're that rubbish for 15 minutes. That if we're not that rubbish for the rest of the game, it's okay. But the Wigan game the weekend before, we was we was decent. We was right in it up to the hour. Unfortunately, we switched off for the first goal. Um, but if you've got money to spend I said I wasn't going to talk about budgets but if you've got money to spend you, you get better players and, and with that you get better depth and you get better options off the bench and I think Wigan bought on Guion Edwards and, and Gavin Massey who've both played in the championship Massey's involved in the clinch of the second goal so be it good luck to him I've said that all season good luck to Wigan I hope they do really well I said apart from two games against us when I hope they're shite but the rest of the time I hope they do really well because their fans have been through it much like yours have for, for you know slightly different reasons um, mm. and I obviously they nearly lost their club completely. You've had other issues with, with owners. Uh, might not have got quite to that stage, but you, you're suffering. You shouldn't be in this division. I get that. Um, and yeah, money money, money buys you better players and, and it gives you better options. But Saturday was a couple of steps back because there, there were performances in the last few weeks going to Cambridge and winning 2 0 where there were proper Steve Evans, Gillingham performance. But, but Saturday was anything but. And it was it was awful. Absolutely shocking. When you say about Steve Evans, say so you said... Um... He said something on the lines of, Steve Evans really annoys me. I'm pretty certain you're the only fan in League One that feels that way. <laughs> sure yeah, Steve I mean, he annoys me from time us. to time. There's a lot of opposition fans that, that permanently <laughs> feel like that, and I get that, and that's fine. And I was one of them opposition fans up until about two summers ago. <laughs> but that, you know, it's it's all right. It's, it's that adage, isn't it? You'd rather have him in the tent pissing out than, than outside the tent pissing in. Yes. Um, but yeah, I, I thought he got it wrong. Uh, for me, go and have a go. Chuck a striker on. Sacrifice a defender. If we get beat 3-0, at least we can say we've, we've gone and had a go. But I can't. We, I think we had two shots second half and I can't remember either of them, to be honest. I think the closest we came to scoring was Ryan Tafazoli, the Wickham centre-half. Went to wear the ball back to the keeper and the keeper had already started to come and it went over his head and he had to sort of tip it wide and they hacked it clear. But apart from that, there was absolutely nothing. You touched on... Um sort of management there and we also touched on, on ownership. I'll be honest, I'm coming in a little bit blind other than the, the stuff I think I retweeted from yourself which some people might have seen the week ago. But I think the ownership situ situation for Gillingham doesn't seem to be all okay, um, for want of a, a better phrase. I'm, I'm coming into it fairly blind, as I suppose uh, perhaps most Sunderland fans would be as well. Um, can you give us a bit of an overview on what's been happening with Jill's fans and Paul Scully and why there's been a bit of unrest recently? Um. I think the biggest thing is, is he's, he's started up this chairman's chat, which we all thought was a great idea. We see the, the likes of the Andy Hulks of this world and the Dara McCantonese, and, and I think the new owner from Bristol Rovers has done it and been quite vocal. And Stuart Donald once upon a time. Didn't happen. Didn't work. Yeah, that didn't end great, did it? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so this, this chairman chat series started in the summer and it was meant to be a regular thing. And then we started getting the excuses, oh, he's too busy, we can't do it. And then it was, then it just became... I think, and to myself as well, and I've I've never been scally out entirely. He does things that annoy me, don't get me wrong. I, I think he makes wrong decisions. I think he says the wrong thing. I think that at times, he, I think the biggest fall down that, that Paul Scully's had throughout his entire reign with Gillingham, and if he's been there since 1995, he must have done something right, and I get that. But his people skills are unbelievably poor in terms of communicating with fans. And, and it just quickly turned into a a battle between fans and, and him and him wanting people to feel sorry for him and people that were disagreeing with what he's doing weren't proper fans and 
there was this <laughs> article that came out a couple of years ago where he quoted it was quote unquote I think I've done if I've got this word for word that some fans were a cancer to the club and that didn't sit well and it didn't sit well with me and this come after the Shrewsbury game and I'd just travelled 600 miles to watch us play for one half and lose 2-1 to a team that hadn't scored all season so to be told you're not a proper fan I think probably sort of smarted a little bit um, obviously there's, there's there's individuals and groups that have stronger views on it than, and they want him gone and that's why the chanting is becoming more prevalent and of course you all know as a football fan if you're not happy with the board and your football team's playing crap and losing then you have to turn on someone I think the biggest thing for me is that even the people that didn't want Steve Evans to come into the club actually feel sorry for Steve Evans now um, they feel like he's having to work with one hand tied behind his back. And again, we can talk about COVID pandemics and we understand that there's a natural order that I've already mentioned. But I think a lot of fans just feel that there wasn't enough done in the summer. And we left ourselves a little bit short and playing catch up straight away. And then with a couple of injuries or a handful of injuries, we've looked thin on the ground pretty much all season. We've had teenagers on the bench a lot of league games that, that shouldn't really be on the bench. We've had teenagers, the same ones, starting in EFL Cup games, EFL Trophy games, which is great. That You know, a lot of people don't like the, the stuff crust crap or whatever it's called, but it serves a purpose for me. And I, you know, if, 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 you, if you do okay in it and you progress to the, to the knockout stages, you're playing at least four games. So that could be four games for youngsters, fringe players, people returning from injury that, that need minutes. Um, like everyone else, I, I don't think there should be Premier League B teams in it. If, if a Premier League team wants their players to go and learn how to play the game at a men's level, then send them out on loan to said EFL clubs so that your oh, player benefits and, and, and our team benefits. Don't tell Pep that. <laughs> no, that's. Um, I'm sure he's listening anyway, so he'll probably take on board what we're saying. Um, but yeah, I just think, unfortunately, when you're not playing well, to get back to Paul Scully, it, it's someone has to be to blame and at the moment it's it's Paul Scully that's taking a lot of it <laughs> and he certainly doesn't help himself I'm not saying that all fans act the right way I think some go over the top um, and if there's been personal abuse or attacks on him in in the street or in grounds or whatever I'm not saying he's been physically attacked but if people are going up to him screaming abuse at him I don't agree with that but I can understand why there seems to have been a shift in that there's more more people that were sitting on the fence are probably now Scally out and more that were Scally's doing a decent job have probably shifted to the on the fence bit and are probably leaning towards the Scally out thing. I think on the playing front, you've touched on it a little bit there about the summer, but we'll, we'll go into it in a bit more depth. <laughs> We've spoke about it on, um, on, on and off air a few times, I think really on various different platforms. Uh, you lost obviously a lot of big players in the summer. Uh, Jordan Graham being the standout name, he obviously went to Birmingham. Jack Bonham, really good goal at this level, and that's why he's gone to the championship um, and going to Stoke. Um, and Conor Ogilvy, I think, has been a good player for you for years, and for some reason he chose to go to Portsmouth. I'm, I'm guessing he sees it as a, a better chance to get promoted or something, but regardless of three big players, um, it's always hard to judge if you've recovered well from that a few months into the season, but with 12 league games in now for Gillingham, um, how much has their departures affected the team? Jack Bonham, I don't think it has. I'll be completely honest. I think he was very brave and I, I get that he's trusted his own ability, but I don't understand why you'd go to a championship club when he was an established number one at a team that was competitive. Let's make no bones about that. Oh, we're absolutely. a small club, we're a small fish in a big pond, I get that, but we flirted with the playoffs last season briefly and we finished 10th the last two seasons, the two seasons that Jack Bonham's been there. So to make a move to Stoke where you've literally not played one minute of football so far, and that includes stuff crust games as well. I, I don't quite get it. I get that if he went in there in the summer and he went, right, I'm going to trust my ability to get myself on the bench and play X amount of games in the Cups. But they had two keepers there that, that were highly rated. They had the lad Bursic, I think, who's now the number one that was at Peterborough, I think, on loan last season for a spell yeah. and, and Lincoln. I think he played one game for an, as an emergency for them. And they've got another keeper, is it Davies? Davies I think that yeah. Adam Davies, who, who's, who's decent at that level as well. So I don't understand why you'd leave a club where you're an established keeper where you can keep improving, keep playing games, keep putting yourself in the shop window to just literally go and train because that's all he's doing at the moment. But like I said, if he trusted his own ability, good luck to him. And I've got no you know, ill feeling towards Jack Bonham. Everyone wants to play at the highest level possible. But out of the three, I'd say he's the least of our problems. Conor Ogilvy is a strange one, not really playing for, 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 for Portsmouth. I think he's played a couple of positions. I think he's played centre-back. 
He's played left back. I think his first game was actually centre midfield because they had an injury crisis. Yeah. We're missing him massively. And that, that's no disrespect to David Chitonda, who's coming from Bristol Rovers, who, who's improved in recent weeks. He had a very shaky start to his career with Jules, but we have to bear in mind he missed pretty much all the pre-season because of COVID. He was one of those that missed 20 days because he had he had the, the ping and then he, he had a positive test as well. Um, then he's had a red card. That didn't help at Wimbledon, first month of the season. But the trouble with Conor Ogilvy and Jordan Graham was that whoever we bought in was going to be a downgrade. And that's no disrespect to any player that's come in um, because they were so influential for us over the last season and a half, two seasons. And Jordan Graham, again, he's another one's not really playing for Birmingham, which is frustrating to see when we're crying out for width. But I can understand why he made the move. Um, and I think he suffered with injury. So, you know, he might get himself into contention. But I look at the way Birmingham play and they looked to play a back three with four in midfield, a 10 and two strikers. The reason Jordan Graham left Wolves was because he's not a wing back. And he said that he's not a wing back. And that's why he left when I think it was Paul Lambert or Nuno, the Spirito Santo, took over. So where's he going to play if they're playing wing backs again? Because that's, that's not his role. He, play, he plays wide left or right in a 4 3 3, and he's very good at it. Um, but yeah, we miss him massively. I mean, 13 goals, 12 assists last season. That's, that's big numbers. The hope is that if Huge. Mustafa Carriol can get himself fit quickly, because he was just running into some form and Danny Lloyd can stay fit, that they might be able to sort of reach their numbers between them. But at the moment, we just look very blunt in attacking in, in attacking areas, which means we're not getting the best out of Dane Oliver, who probably had his worst game since joining at the weekend. Um, Steve Evans has said that. I, I would have to agree. He was he was well off the pace, but he's got enough credit in the bank as Big V. He's, done, he's, he's won us plenty of points over the last season and a bit to, um, to be allowed a day where he's not quite at it. Um, but yeah, you'd have to say the biggest one at the moment is is Jordan Graham because of the numbers that he produced last season. With Jordan Graham, uh, not Jordan Graham, sorry, but I know they touching it there about his, his last game. He had a phenomenal season last season, kind of came out of nowhere, really. Um, I think it's fair to say he was one of, if not the bargain of the season. I know you're a big fan, obviously. Um, he scored four league goals in 12 and six in 16, I think, in total. Um, Teddy struggled the last game, but on, on the whole, obviously, you can see he's got a few less goals who scored less frequently, but still not a, a bad record at all considering where you are in the league. But is he is he missing the service of Jordan Graham or is there a little bit more to it than that? I think he's missing the service of wide players. Not It doesn't have to specifically be Jordan Graham. It, it, we've not played with enough width, I don't think, throughout the season and that comes because of injury. So we've had to play. Danny Lloyd had to play up front at the start of the season. He's, he's come in as a wide man. Um, Carriol, like I say, was running into some form. Um, and then he, he pulled a muscle in training the day on, day before the MK Dons game, I think, and he's missed seven. So there's your width. We then lost Alex McDonald in the summer. We didn't get him back till probably five games ago. For Dane Oliver thrives on service, you know that. You, you've, you've spoken to me enough about it and, and we've all watched enough highlights packages and, and EFL highlights programmes and Sky Sports and that type of thing and, and if you get balls wide and get into the final third and you and you can get delivery into the six yard box the Dane Oliver comes alive he, he, we see all the, the aerial stats and how many aerial battles he wins and he's miles absolutely miles out in front of everybody else I think weirdly though he's, he's actually got more at this stage in all competitions than he did last season because he had that real purple patch from sort of February March last season where I think he got like eight in nine but he, he's been decent but, but he's played when he's not been fit. He's had an ankle problem that he had to play. He went to Shrewsbury and he played. Shouldn't have even travelled. But we had to play him because we didn't have another striker fit. Um, and he basically hobbled around for 90 minutes. And then he played at home to Wigan last week with a rib problem. He was probably about 85% fit. Still done absolutely everything that he can because you know that if he's on the pitch, he'll run for a brick wall for you. But he doesn't miss Jolt. He does miss Jordan Graham. That's wrong. I can't say he doesn't because Jordan Graham's very good at this level. But we need to play with more width. We've had no Ryan Jackson pretty much for the whole season, which is, you know, one of them fullbacks that wants to get on. We've had to play Robbie McKenzie or Reese Bennett there. They're not the same. They're not dynamic fullbacks like Ryan Jackson who wants to get on the overlap. Um, but he's still doing all right. He's got, I think it's five in 14 I'm looking at on this app that I use in all competitions. Um and I'm confident he'll get 15, 20 again if he gets the service. But at the moment, my bigger concern is if he doesn't score, who does? I think our next top scorer is Danny Lloyd with two. And I think own goals is top, is second as well. I was going to say, because when you move away from Vidal Oliver and Jordan Graham, 
Um, last season, they were obviously the standout two. They're the ones that will put the numbers on the board, which is what you see. Um, and it's fair to say they're the ones that impressed when you, you came up against us in the two games last season. But then I kind of forgot even played for you, to be honest, because I was obviously I've brought in Charlie Kelman um, on loan um, on deadline day, I think it was. He was on the bench on uh, Saturday. But then I seen who was up front alongside with Dan Oliver and you had um, John McKinney, who I kind of completely forgot existed to an, a point, to be completely honest with you. So I decided to look at his stats. Um, one goal this season, 7-44 and 44 last season. He came with quite a decent reputation, but is it fair to say Gillingham fans maybe don't think that goals are going to come from John McKinney this season? Yeah. I think if you'd, if you'd been regularly to games and heard where was it we went to? Cambridge a couple of Tuesdays ago and a portion of our fan base was sarcastically cheering and jeering if he missed in the warm-up, which again doesn't help for me. Um, no. But he was he was probably our best player Saturday. Not, that's no glowing reference. I'm not saying he was, you know, he turned into prime Ronaldo because <laughs> we were cack. <laughs> but he was certainly the best of a bad bunch. He'd cut the shots on target, one just off target, won a lot of his battles. He was linking up play. I think it's him that makes the flick on out wide that, that eventually leads to us winning the penalty. Not sure he scored this season. Has he scored this season? No, he's not. No, he hasn't. You're absolutely right. He hasn't scored. I'm telling the lie. He actually had one assist. Yeah, he's got an assist. That was uh, the Cambridge game when he yes. set up when he set up for Dan Oliver with the flick on. Yeah, we As need John Kindy fit. We haven't got the biggest squad at the end of the day, so we need to get behind all of the players. Charlie Kelman's a weird one. Like I say, he was one of the two Saturday that, that didn't get bought on when you're chasing the game. And that was odd. I feel a bit sorry for him. He was decent. He made his debut in the in the Pizza Trophy against Colchester. Um. Second half, he was really bright. He had a couple of shots. He had a header that was really well saved. He had one where he'd done all the hard work, took it off the fullback and cut inside the centre half and then Ben Reeves nicked it off him and dragged it wide. He'd have probably scored. Um, he was decent at Burton. That was his first league game. I think he set up the goal for the Dane Oliver that put us in front. And then we was all excited about seeing him at home to MK Dons. And unfortunately, he was the one that got hooked after Stuart O'Keefe decided to be a dickhead twice in two minutes and got himself sent off. And since then, he's, he's not really had a look in. And he, he played last week in the the trophy game against Ipswich, but we played him wide left of a free in behind John Akindi. So I think it was needs must and it was just giving him minutes anywhere, but it, it didn't work. He was better second half, should have had a penalty. Um, Trevor Kettle, that's all you need to know. Um, but yeah, it's just it's just not really worked out yet. He's, he's, he's been a bit stop start and again, like us, one step forward and two steps back all the time, unfortunately. But he's a talented kid. We know that. Um and I'm certainly not writing him off after six, seven games. In terms of other players that you brought in in the summer, the, the obvious names that stick out, you, you mentioned obviously um, Mustafa Carriol. He's one that obviously we'll know with him being at Borough previously. Um, Ollie Lee came back on a permanent deal, although he kind of was with you last season anyway. Mm-hmm. Ben Reeves, you've just touched on slightly there, but Max Aimer, probably the, the biggest one, went to Bristol Rovers. That didn't work out because, well, I don't think he saw eye to eye with Joey Barton. I'm sure he's not the first and he won't be the last. Um, how have the players you brought in been doing and on the evidence so far if I'm not asking a daft question has the summer recruitment been adequate? Adequate's probably the best way to describe it mm. no more um, Carriol looks to be the bright spark he's the one we need fit I think to be the creative force to be the one that can get us into good areas up the pitch and carry the ball and, and get us into dangerous areas we lack pace at the moment and that's killing us um, when you play two big men up front I think you have to have quick wingers Danny Lloyd's not no slouch, don't get me wrong, but he's not out and out quick like a Jordan Graham. Um, and, and obviously Mustafa Carriol's missed the last seven games, so we've missed his pace. We've missed Ryan Jackson's pace from right back. So we've just felt a little bit pedestrian and a little bit predictable this season so far. And like I say, if, if John Akindi doesn't score, it's a bit concerning as to where the goals are up. Did I say John Akindi? You said John I mean, I know you, you said he scored. He didn't score. Now he didn't I'm talking score. rubbish as well. Well, my research has never been good. Score, I'm a little bit <laughs> concerned about who's going to score the goals for us. Um, but like I said, we'll, we'll keep going and we'll keep cheering them on and we'll keep hoping. And, and you, you only need, you know, one win. You know, if, say we shit hours of one nil in the last minute against you, it might kickstart our season. But and I'm generally glass half full, but I, I, I genuinely can't see it at the moment. There's just we just look blunt in attack and we've just started conceding too much, too many the other way as well. And in terms of the transfers, like I say, they've all, Max Amar started, he's been really solid on the whole, but he had an absolute nightmare Saturday. He got bullied by Sam Bokes for the first, got the run around from Brandon Anland. 
which he shouldn't do. Neither should Jack Tucker. They played with him. So they know what he's all about. They know how he plays the game. But with Hanlon, they both decided they didn't know whether to get touch tight and then they would be in span. And then if they dropped off, they was allowing him to run. And it caused us all manner of problems. And then panic stations set in and we just looked like rabbits in headlights every time that Wickham got within 20 yards of our box. Um, ben Reeves has been in and out the side. He looks tidy enough, looks a nice player. Has he really done anything in a game that's made you sit up and go, wow, not yet. Ollie Lee looks half the player that he was when he was on loan. Is that because he's now got a contract and he's got comfortable? I'm sure it's not, but it just hasn't happened. But he's got two assists this season, so he's one of our highest assist makers. But if you'd watch him, you'd wonder how, because he's been well off the pace in plenty of the games. Um, Jamie Cumming, the keeper's probably been one of the standouts, but that's probably because he's been overworked. <laughs> There was that thing, isn't it? You want to keep the be playing with pipe and, uh, pipe and slippers, don't you necessarily? But when they're exactly, yeah, you don't want to know what you keep doing because it means the ball's up the other end. But <laughs> at the moment, unfortunately, it's 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 not. And I think obviously at the time of speaking, we're speaking before Sunderland's Papa John's Trophy game with Man United, twelve year olds, whatever we're playing. I don't know. Um, not a big fan of the Peter Trophy until you win it, of course. Then it's the best trophy on the planet. Um, but you're currently fourth bottom at the time of speaking, which. Obviously, it's some great compared to where I think we both spoke ourselves about where we thought thought you would go. I figured you might struggle a little bit. I certainly didn't see you to be anywhere near relegation. Um, but because of the start you've had, because of where you are at the moment, are the Jill's fans a little bit concerned that relegation could become a thing? So this is the thing that I I asked the question on my Monday review, looking at the, the Wickham game on before I ended it. I said at what point do we become concerned that we are in a relegation battle? And we walked out of the ground Saturday and looked at the fixtures and we said Sunderland's not, not important in the grand scheme of things next Saturday. It is because you want to win football matches, but Tuesday after that, we play Doncaster at home. That's massive. Mm-hmm. Um, so if we are in a relegation battle, is it a six-pointer? Because we're now 25% of the way through the season. People always say 10, 12, 15 games the season starting to take shape, the table's starting to form, and that's where teams are generally going to be. But at the moment, we're we're just outside by the skin of our teeth. But we played one or two games more than, than pretty much every team below us because we was one of the few games that didn't get called off last weekend. So, yeah, I don't think it can go much further before we have to say we are in a in a dogfight at the moment, and that's that's concerning because it's not something we've been used to over two seasons with with Steve Evans in charge. And my biggest concern is that if Steve Evans walks away, we're up shit creek without the proverbial paddle to be quite frank because no disrespect to previous managers aside from probably Justin Edinburgh God rest his soul um, since then we had managers that were shopping in non-league league two bottom end league one markets they certainly don't have the contacts that Steve Evans and Paul Rayner have in terms of being able to go to Chelsea and get a goalkeeper being able to go Arsenal last season getting two players on loan going to Southampton and getting two players being able to go Celtic and get players. Not all these players have worked out and I'm not saying they all have and they've not all been well beaters, but we wouldn't even entertain that if we didn't have Steve Evans. Um, fans always say, and Steve Evans says, his teams do generally get better second half of the campaign, but you have to be giving yourself a chance going into the second half of the campaign. I think the fear at the moment amongst some of the Jules fan base is that if results continue this way, it might be a little bit too late before January comes around. And then you have the added problem that your best players don't want to hang around. I think Jack Tucker, Carl Dempsey, the Dane Oliver can all talk to clubs in January because they'll be out of contract next summer. Um, and then it will get pretty toxic, I'd imagine, towards the chairman. It's been a, to be fair, on the flip side, I suppose, it has been a, a recent difficult run. Obviously, you won at Cambridge 2 0, but for where Jung and probably want to be, you don't want to be losing those games. But Ipswich, strengthened a lot they found a bit of form it was in the Peter Trophy Wickham I think they're a decent team at this level I mean the second I think at the minute obviously there's games mm-hmm. in hand that we have on them but points on the board are the most important thing not games in hand is there also a feeling that like well this has been quite a tough run don't cast out of the games when we get out of these top six teams we, we can maybe put a bit of run together there's, there's enough evidence from other games you've had previous in the season against teams that aren't top six teams or expected to be top six teams that you can start pulling results um, out of the bag rel- with relative ease? I don't know, with relative ease, because with, with defeats and, and poor form comes a lack of confidence when everything yeah. becomes a little bit harder. But yeah, but unfortunately, if you look at our two wins this season at the moment, we won against two sides that came up from League Two and that's no disrespect to Morecambe or Cambridge, who I think have been brilliant so far. Both mm-hmm. clubs have been really, really good, but 
yeah, if you look at the results, we drew with Lincoln first day of the season. They got the playoff final. So that's not a bad result, face value. We lost last minute to Plymouth, who were right up there. So is that such a bad result? We, we were a minute away from claiming a, a clean sheet against a side that's right up there now. Wimbledon, we were shocking and got away with it. 98th minute equaliser with 10 men. Morecambe, we were good. Um, Shrewsbury, we were decent first half. Then injuries, we probably ended up with five players on the pitch at the end of that game that shouldn't have even been in the squad. So that catches up with you. But we were decent, should have been out of sight at half time, didn't take our chances. It came back and bit us on the, <coughs> on the arse, excuse me. <coughs> um, MK Dons, it's tough against them with 11 players. So when your vice captain gets sent off after half hour, it, it's game over and it, and it ended up and it, it was very comfortable in the end. But we had a go, but they're very good at keeping the ball, MK Dons. We know that. Um, Cambridge was, was comfortably our best performance of the season. There'd been decent draws. Charlton Oxford got in and around the playoffs last season. But I just keep coming back to that nagging thing that it just doesn't feel like the last couple of seasons. You know, games against us have been tough and we've been in your face. We've beaten you a couple of times at our place, kept a clean sheet. The cup game a couple of seasons ago, the, the last minute winner, Connor Ogilvy, a couple of seasons ago, the last minute equaliser at your place last season mm-hmm. when Jordan Graham smashed one in the roof of the let Lee Burge helped us out I'll get that the season before me Commandron was brilliant and we drew two all we deserved to draw two all but at the moment I, I, I see us playing these teams and I just think I can't see us hurting them enough and I can't see us being solid enough for 90 minutes to be able to get anything out of the game and I hate being like that because like I said I'm, I'm generally glass half full but the performances in recent weeks have been flat really really flat on the flip side, I know you keep a close eye on games across League One because, you know, obviously people have listened to the other podcast we do with Tom. Um, and we speak, obviously, almost weekly, I would say. But but Portsmouth aside, Sunderland fans have been really happy this season. I think there's reasons for that Portsmouth game, um, no matter what Portsmouth fans want to say. Not that bothered. Um, we've been happy with it. It's fair to say this season for us feels in a different way to how it feels for you. Different would be the word. It does feel different this season. Mm. What have you made of Sunderland start from the outside looking in? I think they've been bright. I think, obviously, we, we've spoken on the third tier and, and on WhatsApp and Twitter about certain Charlie White. And um, I know you're a big fan. You're almost mm. as big a fan of him as you are of the Saudi Arabian takeover. Um, <laughs> but, but, but Bruce, I like him slightly more, for the record. Slightly more. I like Charlie slightly more than the Saudi Arabian takeover. Just a little takeover. bit. Just a tad. <laughs> Human rights and all that, you know, slightly. He did score 31 goals, I guess. But what you want when when someone leaves, you scores that volume of goals, regardless of performances and, and stuff that he doesn't do or does do. You want someone who comes in and and, and threatens to, to at least get close to that. I mean, 31 is a phenomenal target. You, you're yeah. probably not going to get someone that's going to match that unless you spend big bucks. And, and Sunderland's history being on Netflix, you're not guaranteed to get that even when you do spend big bucks, unfortunately. <laughs> and I'm talking about the unfortunate Will Grigg, who seems to have settled at Rotherham and is doing very well. So if, I'm sure Will Grigg is watching as well. Love you, Will. Um, but Will. but Ross Stewart's doing a brilliant job. And um, it means that you've forgotten about Charlie White. And for me, as an outsider looking in, I just think the squad looks more balanced. There's a great blend of youth and experience. I think you look at the youngsters that have come in that you've got on loan or you've managed to get on free transfers. And then you've still got the likes of McGeady. You've still got the likes of O'Neill, who's 26 now. He's experienced at this level. Um, Alex Pritchard, a clever signing, might not play every week, but knows the level, knows the championship. Must be, you know, his late 20s now. At Tottenham as a kid, he's played for Norwich, Huddersfield higher up. Um, you've got Aidan O'Brien, experience in the championship. Again, might not play all the time. Carl Winchester has, has, has turned into Cafu this season. Love him. Love him. Um, it just looks like a squad that, barring a massive injury crisis, you look to have all the bases covered this season. Whereas I think in previous seasons, if Charlie White or Lady McGeady didn't fire, then you was quite easy to play against. Not easy to play against, but you was easier to play against and you could stop Sunderland playing. Whereas now, you've got more dynamism in the middle of the park. I think you've got Dan Neal, you've got Elliot Embleton, youngsters that, that want to prove themselves, want to do well. They're chipping in with goals and assists. So then there's less pressure on Ross Stewart. And he he, he knows that if, if I don't score today, then someone else is likely to go and pinch one for us. And like I said, you've got Carl Winchester. I think he's got three in the league already this season, which is phenomenal for a right back. Yeah, I think he's got more than 
career sure. last draw because put so together. He scores every week. It's ever since he it was, I think it was the Wimbledon game when I screamed at him not to shoot, and he did shoot and he did score. I've decided to just, sh- just shout shoot at him randomly. And every um, shot, why not? Yeah, I did meet him the other week though, and I told him that I loved him, and he did look a little bit scared. So, Carl, if you are listening, <laughs> um, it was they're just all a listening. Joke. Just listening. Joke. The Saudis are listening. Will Griggs listening. Carl Winchester's listening. A big time here, aren't we? <laughs> the, the, the Saudis will definitely have an eye on me because I'm officially a journalist, so I better not be too critical. Charlie um, won't be watching. Nah, nah, Charlie won't be watching. I can guarantee that. <laughs> um, as always, the final question is the same as, as it always is, score predictions. Um, I'm, I'm horrendous at them. I'm never going to get good. I got one right this evening. I thought, brilliant, I've got one right. It like, took me till April last year to get one right, so... Um, 2-0 Sunderland I, I fancy a relatively comfortable similar to last season maybe potentially actually that last season wasn't comfortable at all he missed a penalty and then we you know, that, but the shot up Grim um, I think 2-0 is what I'm going to say 2-0 yeah I, I, I've written down 2-1 to Sunderland purely because we've not scored for three games and I'm just hopeful at least if we score we'll have something to cheer about but I'm not I'm not confident at all and again like I said if people watch my channel I, I I rarely back against us. Maybe I don't say we win every week, but I can't see us getting anything at the moment. Certainly, if we play like we did against Wickham, then it'll be it will be comfortable. It'll be very comfortable. Um, but yeah, I'm going to say two one to Sunderland. I've, I've written down for Dane Oliver for Jules, and then Ross Stewart and Aidan McGeady for Sunderland. Winchester, always Winchester, always Winchester. <laughs> Matt, thanks always for joining me, mate. Um, I know there'll be people that follow you anyway because if they follow me, the likelihood is they've, they've seen me retweet your stuff. But for the people who haven't, if for some reason it's the first time they've tuned in and the, or the first time they've tuned in and heard you, which would be a big shock, let's be honest. Um, where can they find your stuff? Uh, we're on Twitter, we're on Instagram, on YouTube, at Jules in the Blood or at Jules in the Blood TV. So yeah, go and check us out. It'd be brilliant if you can drop a subscribe to the channel. I think we're only 18 away from 1,700 subscribers. So always looking for opposition fans to come on and do this type of thing. So, yeah, drop a sub, get in touch. I love talking about football. So, just not drilling them at the moment because we're a bit shit. I was going to say subscribe to mine as well, but you don't have to. You can if you want. You should. It's it's a good channel. You should. It's a good channel. Look at us blowing smoke up each other's asses. to be fair. Subscribe to both at the same time. Directly at the same time, but don't subscribe at all. You've got to do it exactly at the same time. Same finger, <laughs> two different devices. Um Matt, thanks so much for joining me, mate. Appreciate it. Good speaking. As always, thank you.